we are going to learn here today is that many things go wrong in the world because of lack of prophecies. Many things go wrong in the world today with humanity because of lack of prophecies. And from this lesson we are going to learn that uh, where there is no prophecy, the people perish. Where there is no prophecy, no progress. Where there is no prophecy, there is confusion. Where there is no prophecy, you have dissensions, disagreements among people. Where there is no prophecy, you have wars and so on and so forth. It's due to the lack of prophecy. In Hosea chapter 4 verse 6, it's well stated, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Now, what knowledge is Hosea writing about here as a prophet? The knowledge of the things that God has to reveal to us. Take note of that. So we do not walk by the revelations of God's mind, but we work according to our human understanding, our human minds. It is a big error when we operate without prophecies. From this lesson, you will learn that from the levels of the chiefs to the highest level, of administration in whichever area that someone is bound to head people he is bound to make sure that he works with prophecy and prophecy will, you will understand with me that whatever does not come from God's mind is not prophecy listen to me very carefully Whatever does not come from God's mind is not prophecy. And therefore, it is only God's mind that brings a revelation that many people don't know by which, when it is given unto them, it comes to fruition, it comes to reality, it comes to pass. And people will be amazed because it is something that they never knew. Prophecy is the unveiling of concealed messages in God's mind. The unveiling of concealed messages in God's mind. So therefore, a real prophet speaks but God's mind. Listen to me very carefully. And such prophets don't speak all the time. They don't. They speak very little. And whatever they say comes to pass because it is something which God himself said. Take note of that. And that is why in Amos 3, 7, Amos chapter 3, verse 7, it is written there that God does nothing to the world without first of all messaging his servants the prophets open to Amos 3 7 so therefore prophecy is something which comes from God's mind and he sends it to the people who are the prophets to say it out to the nations and whatever they say which is God's mind God backs it up and it comes to pass. So that is why now in this lesson that we are going to learn here, you, you are going to see how Paul prophesied. And the people neglected his prophecy. But it came to pass. Now when they started believing in his prophecies, they were saved. And they did not lose many of their goods. As Paul was set to sail to make his defense to King Caesar. Hallelujah. So this time around, uh, we are going to move into the work proper uh, to
today. You know my usual way of doing things is that I like to read that all of us read. Uh, as I was talking, I believe that you must have collected your Bibles or you must have tuned to your phones to get to the page where I am about to elaborate this morning the message which will open up your minds and your hearts towards knowing the importance of prophecy. And uh, without much ado, we move on to reading the message. Paul says to Rome, that is the little subject that we have there, and when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, the delivered Paul and the certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band. Two, and entering into a ship of Adramisium, we launched meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, and Aristarchus, <clears throat> a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. Three, and the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius cautiously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go into his friends to refresh himself. For, and when we had launched from thence, we sailed unto Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. Five, and when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lydia. Six, and there a centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. Seven, and when we had sailed slowly many days, and the scares were come over against Nidus. The wind not suffering us, we sailed on the Crete over against Salmon. Eight, and hardly passing it, came on to a place which is called the Fair Heavens. Nigh whereunto was the city of Lesia. I'm reading from King James, please. Now, nine. Now, when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already past, Paul admonished them. Ten, and said unto them, Says, I perceive that this voyage will be hurt with hurt and much damage, not only of the leading and the sheep, but also our lives. This is the first prophecy in verse 10, which Paul gave. That was his first prophecy. To the people with whom they were sailing to Italy, 11. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken of Paul, the apostle. And because the heaven was not commodious in winter, in the more part advised the deep to depart thence also, also if by any means they might attain to Phoenix, and there to winter, which is an haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. 13. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they should, op should have obtained their purpose, losing thence their sail close to Crete. 14. But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurocledon. <laughs> Eurocledon. <laughs> 
15, and when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And 16, and running under a certain island, which is called Cloda, we had much work to come by the boat. 17, when they had taken up the used helps on the guiding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quick sands, straight sail, and so were driven. 18. And we, exceedingly tossed by the tempest, the next day lightened the ship. <laughs> 19. On the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. 20. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempests lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was taken away. 21. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Says, You should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this hard loss. You can see that in 21, he blamed them for not obeying his prophecy. 22, and now I exhort you to be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the sheep. He gives another prophecy in 22. For there stood by me by this night an angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. 24. Saying, Fear not. Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. 25. Wherefore, says, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. 26. How be it, we must be cast upon a certain island. 27. The shipwreck starts. But when the 14th night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adrian about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country. 28. And sounded and found it 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found 15 fathoms. 29. Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks and wished for the day. They cast four anchors out of the stain, 30, and as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship when they had let down the boat into the sea, on that color, as though they would have cast anchors out of the four ship. 31. Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. This is his third prophecy in verse number 31. Now, 32. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. 33. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to meet. 
which means to eat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. And thirty-four, Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health, and there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. 35. And when Paul had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when they had broken it, he, Paul, began to eat. Verse number 36. Then were they all of good cheer and also took some meat. It's not meat, it is food. <laughs> 37. And we were in all the sheep, 203 score and 16 souls. We'll look at it mathematically and we'll come out with the figures that we can appreciate today with our understanding of this day about counting of figures. 38, and when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. Jettison. 39, and when it was dim, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into the which they all were minded, if it were possible, to thrust into the ship. Now, 40, and when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves into the sea and loosed the rudder bands and hoist up the, mainsail, the mainsail to the wind and made towards shore. 40, and falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the four parts stuck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the wave. 42, and the soldiers Council was to kill the prisoners lest any of them should swim out and escape. 45. But the centurion willing to save Paul kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to the land. 44. And the rest, some on board, and some on broken pieces of sheep. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to the land. Dear televiewers, this is where the end of the reading is. Therefore, we move now to getting what we really want to know here. In the earlier uh, chapters that we read, we saw how Paul made his defense to Felix, and uh, Festus succeeded Felix as governor uh, in Caesarea. Furthermore, uh, Benice, in Agrippa, came visiting Festus, and Paul was tried. But at one point in time, Bernice, Festus, and Agrippa decided not to cause Paul's death or to cause him to be killed. And so, only because of the fact that Paul appealed to Caesar, and which Caesar is in Rome, or was in Rome at that time, they said, if that be the case, let him stay back in prison until he is sent to Caesar 
one to whom he has appealed. You can get that. So this is now the journey of Apostle Paul, a very risky one, which is called a voyage. He had to go by sea, and so it is called a voyage. When you travel by sea, you make a voyage. That is it. So he had now to be uh, in sheep and uh, a very risky journey to go to Rome in Italy. You have to get that. And we come down to understand that. And where did Penim and so on and so on? It ran band, certain of the so on. Verse number one. So a centurion was giving Paul and other prisoners to sail to, to Rome. So in this wise, Paul was equally considered a prisoner. He was equally considered a prisoner because he sailed but with prisoners. And because nobody had already declared that he was free, he had to go and make his defense before the biggest man <laughs> in Rome, out of which he will have his total freedom. But without which, he was still considered a prisoner. And entered into a ship of Adri Missium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, and Aristarchus and Macedonian Thessalonica being with us. So therefore you had other men like uh, uh, Aristarchus, who was also sailing with them. And so they kept on sailing through Macedonia and the Thessalonica and all the neighboring uh, cities that would meet the way to Rome, three. And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go to be with his friends and refresh himself. So there was some kind of liberty that was given to the Apostle Paul. Now you can see that he was given some little liberty with respect to the fact that uh, he was not a criminal uh, where they initially put him to trial. He was not uh, seen as a criminal. So even the persons who were sitting with him, though he looked like a prisoner, he was not a prisoner with crime. <laughs> he was a prisoner without crime. And so they had to give him some freedom that he could move with his friends within the ship and that they can refresh themselves to, uh, to move out of the ship and take out some fresh air um, and so on and so forth. Hallelujah. And when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus because the winds were contrary. So the winds were contrary. It begins to make you understand that the winds in the sea were able to toast them away from the direction that they were supposed to go to a different direction. You know, in those days, the ships used to have certain cloths hung around um, those pillars or sticks or whatever. And so it is the force of the winds that will drive the ship to the destination that uh, uh, the, the winds listed. The, the destinations that the winds listed, that is where the ship will go. And therefore, without such, they would lose their direction. Uh, they would not lose their direction, but with such, they would lose their direction that they had to flow in. And when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Miriam, the city of Lycia. So you see, because the wind were was not right, right direction, they moved on to cities like Miria and uh, Lycia, uh, which were not actually in their minds. Beforehand, six, and there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. You can now see, because now they sail to a place where they had not uh, had in their mind before, uh, then now they had a ship in which they were put so that they can carry them now to Italy. Hallelujah. Seven, and when we had sailed slowly many days, and uh, scarce were come over against Crindus, the wind not suffering us, 
we sailed under Crete over against Salmon. So the winds this time were not tempest. They were not uh, very dangerous. They could not change their direction. And so they moved slowly, gently, and then arrived at Salmon. And you can have some of the references here from the book of Acts, chapter number 27, uh, verse number 4, uh, verse number 12, and uh, uh, verse 13, and 21. If you have to get some references from this verse number 7, 8, and hardly passing it came unto a place which is called the fair heavens. My whereunto was the city of Lassia. So the city of Lassia was nigh this area wherein they arrived. And um, the, the, what they call fair heavens. Fair heavens. Uh, uh, and that is where they arrived. Now, when Paul, when much uh, time was spent and uh, when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them. So they had had some time without food and uh, it was a type of fast which uh, they themselves would not know why but Paul now being bold of the spirit decided to speak unto them to bring them more courage so that they will arrive at their destination having not lost courage or fear of death or anything because God was with Paul so he now became like the spokesman unto all of them or their patron to be able to direct their minds in believing that they will have to arrive at their destinations safely. 10. And said unto them, says, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the ladding and sheep, but of our lives. Here this is the first prophecy that Paul gives. He says, listen to me very carefully, all of you, the ship captain, the prisoners, and all of you who are uh, in this ship. Listen to me, I'm going to tell you something that I do perceive in my spirit that this journey that we are uh, carrying on is going to be with some high risk. It's going to be dangerous at a certain point. And therefore, you have to take notice of this, that the journey is going to be with, not without loss. That we have to incur some losses of goods and even lives. That be very careful that this may happen. He warned about it. And that was his first prophecy. So he prophesied unto them God's mind about what was going to happen. Now, through this warning, they were able to know what will lie ahead of them in the few days that were to come. Yes. And in case they believed him, perhaps the dangers would have been averted. The dangers would have been stopped. Because Paul should have conducted something like a prayer from among all of them to avert the dangers that he perceived that were going to happen, not only with property, but also with human lives. This is where now my message Before the heaven was not commodious to winter, in the more part advised the part, thence also, if by any means they might attain to finish, <coughs> and there to winter, which is an heaven of great alliance toward the south, west, and the northwest. So they were moving now to the directions where certain things may happen to them of very high risk 
to the point where they may lose property and lives. 13. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, losing things to sail close to Crete. So the wind now blew and directed them, and they moved to Crete. 14. But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Erocledon. Now, this Erocledon, uh, perhaps in, in English today it could be called a tsunami. So this wind was very, very um, forceful, very, very powerful to change the direction of the ship and also to cause havoc to all of them who were in the ship and their property and even the ship itself. So this Erocledon is the wind that came upon them with high power to destroy. 14. But not long after there arose against what? 15. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. You see? So now they let that Eurocladon wind to drive them to the destination that the wind listed in running on a certain island which is called Cloda, we had much work to come by the boat, you see? So now that wind caused them now to land to where? To Cloda. Seventeen, which when they had taken up the use helps on the guiding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksand, strict sail, and so were driven. So they had to anchor the ship by whatever means they could. You know, each time you have anchors, those things that when the ship is about to stop, they throw it, it pins on the ground or some object so the ship would not move anymore. 18, and we being exceeding toast with a tempest, the next day lighted the ship. So the next day they reached their destinations and they had now to do some lightening of the ship. And 20, and when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was taken away. And therefore, because of the journey wouldn't be smooth, given that the winds were not favorable unto them, all of them lost hope to reach Italy as per their wish. 21. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, says, ye should have hearkened unto me and have loosed from Crete and to have gained. <laughs> now this is the other prophecy Paul gave. He said, had it been you listening to me, or he, he blamed them anyway, he said, had it been you listening to me, then we couldn't have lost this property and we couldn't have sailed to a destination where unto we never wanted to go. Take note of that. So he blamed them for not taking his prophecies seriously. 22. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the sheep. He prophesies again here. He says, this time I'm telling you the truth. All the losses that we have incurred before this time will not repeat itself. 
it has so far ended. And then, take heart, because we are going to sail freely, and nothing more will happen to us as human beings, but the ship will be in danger. But the ship will what? Be in danger. There will be no loss of life, but the ship will be in what? Danger. 23. For there stood by me at night an angel of the Lord whom I serve. He said, An angel of the Lord stood by me at night and gave me information about our journey. 24. Saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought to Caesar, or before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sit with thee. This verse 24 talks about prophecy. The angel brought information, I guess it is Gabriel, because Gabriel all the time is noted for being a messenger angel, a prophetic angel. So the angel brought message from God unto Apostle Paul while in the ship. And the angel told Paul that he will surely arrive Rome in Italy with all the men that he, God, has purposed that they wouldn't die in the ship or in the sea by any means. And that their lives will be saved. That was the unveiling of God's mind to the angel unto Paul. That is prophecy. Prophecy is unveiling God's mind unto his messenger angels to deliver it to humanity. And who is that special person? A prophet who now in turn passes the message to the people. It, let's move back to Amos 3.7. It is written there that God doesn't do anything at all without first of all letting his servants, the prophets, know about it. And when you read again the books of Revelation, verses number 1 through to 3, you will see again how God sent an angel to Apostle John who sat at the, at the island of Patmos and delivered him information which is called revelation, which is also called prophecy of the things that should come to pass. That is prophecy. I told you initially here that my message today is based on you knowing what is prophecy. Because many have gone out there deceiving people that they are prophesying. They say things that do not come from God's mind. They say things that angels who are God's messengers told them. They say things that itchy ears who want to hear sweet talks <laughs> and make themselves happy but which these things never at any time came from God's mouth. 25. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. He said, me, I believe God, and I believe the word of his messenger angel that this thing which I have told you will surely come to pass. It must surely do what? Happen. It must surely take place. 
27. But when the 14th night was come as we were driven up and down in Adriel, and about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near some country. Ah, they have sailed and they came to a place where, oh, here now we are moving towards a certain country. 28, and sounded and found 20 fathoms. And when they sounded a little more, they discovered that it sounded 15 fathoms. Trying to measure the depth of the sea to see how far they are still to get through to the shore. Hallelujah. So they kept on dipping their measuring rods to see the depth of the water. At one point, it was 20 fathoms. At the next point, it was 15 fathoms. Um, uh, by meters, you know, uh, those who are responsible for converting of units like those are 29. Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon rock, they cast four anchors out of the stain and wished for the day. So they threw the anchors out and said, okay, let us stay here aground while hoping that the day must dawn on us while in this very particular place. 30, and um, as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship when they had let down the boat into the sea under color as though they would have cast anchors out of the four ship. Just a few came on. 31. Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except this men abide with us, we cannot be saved. This is another prophecy now of Paul in verse 31. It says that if you would want to kill this man with whom I am, then we all here may not be saved. You can remember that in the vision that Paul had, the angel told him that the Lord has given you this man with whom you sail, that nothing shall happen to them. Which means, through Paul, all of the remaining people that were sailing were not going to die in any circumstance. So Paul perceiving that these people might be shot and killed or be whatever weapons they had to kill them, he said, please, be careful. If any of these men loses his life, all of us here will be at high risk of losing our lives. 32. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. 33. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them or to take meat, saying, This day is the 14th day, and we have tarried. 33 here says, Well, dear brothers and sisters of my brethren, there were no ladies there anyway. Paul said unto them, He said, 14 days have passed by, and we have not eaten anything. So we had had a type of fast without knowing that we've been fasting. And the voice says, so I pray you that we eat something now. Let us have some food. Hmm? It is good for your health and so that you gain strength so that we can say more until we arrive at Italy. 35. And when Paul had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And he broke it, and he was the first person to put the bread in his mouth. You can get that. He was the first person to put the bread in his mouth. He said, you see, we have sailed all this year, all this time, and 14 days, we've not eaten any food. And why do you think that they didn't eat any food is because 
the winds were always tormenting them, <laughs> they will, the winds will drive them to places that they never thought they would arrive at. And therefore, they lose hope. They thought they were almost dying also, as some others have died. And so, so they lost interest in food. You know, when you begin to see a lot of disasters around you, sometimes you do not have appetite. You do not have appetite at all. So this is what happened to them. 36. Then where they all of good cheer and they eat, they eat food. They, they took courage. Paul gave them courage as he ministered unto them and said, please don't bother. Take something to, to eat. 37. And we were in all the ship. 200. Three score, which is 60, and 16, which is 276. By conversion here, it is 276 people, because three score here is 60, and if you add 16 to 60, it becomes 76. And you have, it. that is the number of them that were in the ship. 38, and when they had eaten enough, they lighted the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. They did throw some of the wheat that they had into the sea. They, they, they did what is called in uh, sailing parlance, jettison. Jettison, they did jettison uh, by throwing some of the wheat into the sea. 39, and when it was day, they drew nigh, uh, when it was the day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into the which they were minded, if it were possible, to thrust in the ship. So now they landed again in the place that they never expected to go. But what would they do? They will still anchor there, and 40, and when they had taken up the anchor, they committed themselves unto the sea, and loosed the rudder bands, and hoisted, they hoist up the mainsail to the wind, and made toward shore. Those were activities they did in the ship, so that their voyage could be always uh, as they were to land ashore. 41. And sailing into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the forepart struck, stuck fast and remained unmovable. But the inner part was broken with the violence of the waves. This is what Paul prophesied. He said, this time around, no matter the disasters, we all are going to face because of the tempests, because of the winds, only the ship will be destroyed. Only the ship will be destroyed. You can see that his prophecy has come to pass, that nobody lost his life. But the ship was what? Destroyed. This is all about prophecy. So now, let's look at it. 42. And the soldiers took counsel of themselves to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape, because the ship was destroyed. So they said, for us not to lose our jobs as soldiers the better thing we have to do is let us shoot these prisoners and kill them all well it is not specified whether Paul also was to be shot and killed but as we can read here they counseled among themselves they should kill the prisoners lest they escape 
from their hands. 43. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from the, their purpose and commanded that they which would swim. This centurion really loved Paul. And because he loved Paul, he dissuaded the other soldiers that they should not kill any of the prisoners. Because surely the soldiers intended to kill even Paul for fear of the fact that Paul also would escape. But because of the love that this centurion had for Paul and decided that he shouldn't be hurt, the prophecy which God said to Paul that he had given him and the rest of the people in the ship, 276, a safety decision that they will not die. And therefore you cannot see it coming to pass here that Paul should have been killed alongside those people. But God's prophecy must come to pass. Even the centurion had God's mind in him that he should not kill them. And so he stopped the soldiers. He said, please, don't kill any of the prisoners. And this is how God works in miraculous ways that many of us today ignore. When God says a thing, it must come to pass. If it doesn't come to pass, my Bible said, if a prophet says a thing and it does not come to pass, don't fear him. He is not, I repeat, not a prophet. Take note of that. So now we can call Apostle Paul as a prophet and we can also call him as an apostle because the apostolic mission and the prophetic mission are one. And the rest, some on board and some on broken pieces of ship. So some of them caught broken pieces of ship and they managed now to grab those pieces in order to sail afloat to the border to the seashore for safety. That was verse number 44. Now, I told you that I based this teaching on prophecy. You see, in, in prophecy, we speak God's mind. Listen to me very carefully. In prophecy, we speak what? God's mind, not our minds. But you have seers who are different from prophets. Take note of that. You have seers who are different from prophets. Seers. They see all the time and talk all the time. They don't prophesy. Because I told you, essentially, prophecy is the unveiling of God's mind through an angel to his messenger, the prophet. Or, Jesus himself may come to a prophet and deliver a message Physically, even nowadays, he visits prophets physically and delivers messages to them that they should pass it on to the world. He also comes through dreams to deliver messages to the prophets to be passed on to the world. Let me tell you, if a prophet said, the Lord said that I will be the president of Cameroon, and the prophet died interstate, it means that he was not, I repeat, not a prophet. 